My name is Alexandra Khan. I'm part of the Global Markets team here at 4D Systems. And thank you for joining today. Uh, we are going to go through the build or buy decision and the considerations that manufacturers need to think about in 2022. The format of this webinar is going to be uh, a bit of an introduction and then we're going to get into the meat of a worked example. And then before we get into some q and I'll take you through some case studies of how customers are, uh, are looking at this as well. So I think I'll just add a couple more in and let's get stuck in. Okay, so the make or buy question is a fundamental one faced by many companies uh, and has been for, for a very long time. But right now, many manufacturing companies are re-evaluating their existing processes, particularly having experienced the need to work within finite resources during the pandemic and thinking more strategically about which activities to keep in-house versus what can be outsourced. So here is a really useful framework uh, to consider the make or buy decision. Um, it's been created by the Uni University of Cambridge's Institute for Manufacturing. And, um, and what they wanted to try and do is develop this structured approach, uh, structured framework so that it prevents or helps prevent teams from you know, jumping to what they think might be the best solution or best uh, best option for their business without looking at all of the all of the different um, factors that can influence that decision. So if you look at the top, first of all, it's really important to look at your what's happening in your external environment. Things like geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, tensions and, and how that impacts supply chains, uh, you know, how fierce is that competition, what is the availability of suppliers, uh, delays, um, and also, you know, anything else that really is, is impacting you locally as well as globally. And then what that does is start to, I guess, trigger uh, this decision internally and you start to look at, teams start to look at, well, do we need to respond to those external factors by trying to reduce our costs? Or do we um, need to increase our internal capacity? Or, or is it something that we're struggling to actually um, find skilled workers in that particular area and therefore, um, you know, we have a lack of capacity? Uh, you know, I guess, are you then trying to launch new products into a market that you've that are untested and how much do you want to actually invest in fixed costs when you're not sure how those products are going to perform in the market so do you want to try and keep your costs more variable so there's a lot you know those discussions that start to happen skill shortages for example is a big one at the moment so then what those questions start to make you look at is, is these four, uh, I guess, larger, large areas. So what does your technology and manufacturing processes look like currently? What equipment and technology do you have in-house uh, that you can utilise? What are you lacking? How old are they? Um, are they up to, up to what is required in the market right now? Do you have the technical skills uh, or, or do you need to hire those those in? Um, you know, for example, do you have, you know, the, the quality, uh, um, are you able to, to produce at the quality that you want to for the market or, or is there things that are preventing you from doing that? In terms of cost, you know, it's really important to understand what is the cost to produce in-house with all of the um, overheads as well as well, what does it actually cost you to to outsource it if you are looking at outsourcing what does your supply chain and and, and logistics um, team look like what do your skills look like in-house you know how how skilled are you at selecting the right supplier do you have team members or, or um, the right personnel in place to actually manage that relationship with with your suppliers 
to make sure that you've got all the inventory um, management systems in place to ensure that your delivery is arriving on time to, to slide into the rest of your production schedule. Um, and similarly, you know, in terms of your support systems, do you have, um, you know, if you are building internally, uh, what is your support look like or your support uh, backup look like if your key people go on leave? Uh, what is your key person risk? If you want to try and solve that by outsourcing, uh, what does your supplier's support team look like? What is their technical expertise? What are they willing to offer you in terms of support? Um, it's really only when you start to get into that level of detail that you can really try and weigh up that. And of course, all of this is really important um, to actually understand what your trying to optimize for. So what are you um, what are your performance measures? Are you purely looking at economic benefits and what it what are those um, KPIs? Or are you also wanting to, you know, uh, hit other environmental social benefits as well? And 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 how does this decision, you know, result in in those outcomes? So um, it's you know, we're not going to be able to cover all of this in, in this webinar, but I really do recommend that you go and, and have a look at this framework, um, print a copy, have it up on your wall. Um, I think it's it's an incredibly valuable and, and strong reminder of, of everything that you need to consider. But for the point of today's webinar, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into cost. So the breakdown and, and the worked example we're going to look at is, is this production cost versus acquisition cost. Um, it would be remiss of me if I did not uh, cover an element uh, of the external environment, so here, that's impacting all of us right now, and that is inflation. It's having a significant impact on the price of goods worldwide. And this graph is actually one from Euromonitor International, and it's it's focused on the market for major appliances. And they've forecasted out to 2026 uh, the the growth in them in the market size for major appliances. So it, it looks very similar for uh, small appliances. The market size for for small appliances is much much larger, uh, but the the trend is is the same. So while the market size for appliances is growing year on year the year-on-year -year growth rate is declining. So it grew 3% in uh, 2021 after a couple of dismal years. But then um, it has, it, it is projected to slow that the market sizes, it, the, the market growth is, is predicted to slow year-on-year -year out to 2026, which is then, you know, prompting more of these conversations around, well, how do we best compete in that? slower growing market? What do we need to do to make sure that, um, you know, we are competitive in, in that space that we operate in? Um, and, you know, I guess when you're considering all of it, it really does distill down to, uh, you know, from a production team perspective, you know, how fast do you need to get to market? Is it okay to, to be slower or, or do you really want to try and get to market as fast as you can so that you can get that feedback? Um, what technical expertise is really required? How confident are you that you're going to be able to secure that or do you have that in-house already? And then, um, you know, everything from your de development environment to your production environments, are they ready to go if you wanted to do that in-house or, or are you going to be needing to, to upskill in, in um, a piece of software? But most importantly, if you are looking at those outsource relationships, can you secure parts long term? Absolutely pivotal. And also, um, you know, that dependency on that trusted supplier relationship. Um, and is that something that you're trying to, to build from scratch or do you already have those in place? Um, so now is the time that we want to get stuck into a uh, a real world example and actually have a look at how this cost uh, plays out between, uh, you know, make or buy. So 
here we're going to look at a small kitchen appliance. I feel like I maybe should have had a, an image of a small kitchen appliance here, but if you imagine having a, uh, a touchscreen interface in a appliance, I'll have some examples of it later in the slide, um, but what we are looking at is a small kitchen appliance with a touchscreen interface uh, to control it. We are uh, looking at um, developing 3,000 products or, or getting 3,000 pieces uh, to market per year. And we're going to uh, commit to a two year program, which is a total uh, volume of 6,000 pieces that we're going to be creating. And our production schedule is 250 pieces a month over those 24 months. And, uh, and an assumed cost that we are using is a developer salary of $140,000 a year with all costs um, included. So, you know, that full package, uh, including overheads and um, everything. So um, if you then have your touch screen, so what are we, what are we looking at? We're looking at incorporating a, a, a 4.3 inch LCD TFT with capacitive touch and a glass cover very much like the one that's on screen and you know this is the this is the module um, and then you would be looking to develop something similar in-house trying to develop the same thing so naturally you've got two choices do you design the entire thing in-house which is make or do you source a modular solution like i just showed you um, which is buy now if we look at this second from the bottom row, the estimated unit cost, that's the first thing that everyone starts with is, okay, go online, how much does it cost me to buy a uh, modular solution versus just um, the basics? So $39 USD to, um, to buy uh, a unit that then you will then build upon versus $59.50 for a uh, modular solution. So um, initially, it's totally understandable. It looks like, based on the bill of material, sorry, not bill, of, um, we're not going to mark with this. This is the bill of materials cost to actually build it from scratch, the, the equivalent bill of materials. And then this is actually what the unit is. My, my apologies. So if you look at that, if you're comparing your bill of materials of $39 compared to your $59.50, it's totally understandable that you think that the, the make is, is more cost effective. But when we start to layer on um, and factor in the development costs and the resources required to actually develop that in-house, the overall scenario looks a little bit different and we'll see that in a graph. But let me just take you through uh, what is actually required to develop in-house. So uh, we, based on experience, it would take two development engineers about six months to, to build it from scratch. And so your total development cost at USD is that $140,000. So the $140,000 salary divided by, divided it in half because it's only six months, times by two engineers. So you get back to the $140,000. If you then compare that to a modular design, you have um, you only have a requirement really for one engineer. And the reason, just to go back to why you'd need two development engineers six months, it's really because of the amount of low level design that is necessary to bring it up to where the modular um, module already starts. So that's why it's taking a lot longer to get to to get to this level. And so when you look at a modular solution, it's really only taking one engineer about one maximum two months to get it ready. And that's why we've got it. The development cost at twenty three thousand. So uh, one month is around eleven thousand or twelve thousand uh, dollars because you're dividing one hundred and forty divided by 12, but we're just including here potentially two, two months if it was to take you that long. And so overall, if you look at the total cost, you end up with a very similar 
amount. I mean, a, a very similar total cost, they're out by about $6,000. Um, and it's really important to have a look at how that, you know, translates over those 24 months. So as you can see in this graph, we have on the X axis down the bottom, we've got our, our project time span um, across these 24 months. We're, we're building, we're, we're producing 20, 250 units each month over 24 months. And on the Y axis, on this, on this side, we've got the total cost of the project, the cumulative cost, which this isn't mapping just yet. This graph is actually showing the total unit cost, which is here on the right hand side. So what is it costing to produce um, a unit in each month? So up the top, we can see that the development per the cost per unit to discrete to build in house is way higher than it is um, a module because what's happening is you have your fixed one hundred forty thousand dollar internal development costs, but it's only you've only developed two hundred and fifty. So it does drop down significantly as you produce more and as that fixed cost is amortized over more and more products that you're developing and it slowly comes down and then by the end of that 24 months around the 23 month mark you actually start to break even whereas because your fixed costs are much lower initially your modular or your your buy option is far cheaper for the majority of the project um, and and so it it is something that you know per unit it, it is something that is very important to consider um, in how you actually um, project your your costs because it, it becomes a cash flow issue so if we look at this slide um, what we can see here in these diagonal is actually the cumulative cost over the life of the project. So here, this this light blue line, this is the this is the total cost incurred um, each each month uh, for, and this light blue line is is to build internally. It starts higher because of that hundred and forty thousand dollar initial you know, costs that we have to incur. And then it, and then it, um, a, as you build and the, the bill of materials gets added on for each additional uh, product, uh, you know, 250 units of products, you end up, you know, getting up to, so where we projected up here on the, the 300 and, what was it, 374,000 in terms of a total cost. And it starts to actually get cheaper beyond the 23 month mark. Whereas the buy, um, <clears throat> even though here at the outset, a unit looks far more expensive than the bill of materials for an internal, because your in-house development cost is so much lower, it is so much cheaper, you're, you're outlaying so much less for the majority of the project. And it's only when you get up to that 23 month mark or around 5,700 units that then it starts to become, uh, you know, more expensive cumulatively um, than building in house. And so this is quite important for teams to, to realise because it isn't what is uh, obvious initially. So if this is something that is of interest to you, the best way to actually evaluate whether or not a modular design is for um, is, is going to be useful is actually to order a sample unit um, and actually assess it uh, in a prototype. And if you'd like help uh, determining or trying to work out which module is best for your project and your requirements, then our sales and technical support team are really well placed to help you um, determine which, 
you know, what, what is going to suit your needs. And similarly, our network of distributors uh, is, is extremely well placed to do the same. So we have a very close working relationship with all of our distributors uh, around the world and their teams are really um, well versed in, in 4D systems product range and they are really um, able to actually understand what your requirements are and, and point you in the right direction. And then we'll always support you as well from that technical support and technical advice perspective. And that's what people tend to, to do to get started is work on that prototype, um, understand if we if they can solve the problem and then move into, uh, in, into broader production. Before I get into a couple of case studies, I do want to take you through a couple of key trends that we're seeing impacting the electronic appliance manu um, market. And really, um, they probably aren't surprising to you, but they are really important to, to uh, remember. And that is, uh, there's an increasing demand for products that deliver healthier options. So as you're going out to try and compete within the market, uh, bear in mind that if you can market it as a, a or, or you can achieve um, healthier options as a result of using those appliances, um, then the market is is wanting to pay for those and is willing to. The other thing that um, people are willing to to pay for, and I probably can speak uh, from personal experience here as well, is the uh, the desire to have appliances that perform more than one function. So that versatility, uh, limited bench space. Uh, limited, you know, storage space. You you want something that is going to be able to uh, tick more than um, more than one box. An example of that is, you know, your your uh, like a, a rice cooker that's also a pressure cooker, which is also a slow cooker. Um, you've got one appliance that can do three jobs. And that's because, you know, in the, if you go into the third point, you know, we have so much congestion in our daily lives. We're also looking for, you know, ways to do more with less. And um, we want less things to look after and, and we want them to look after us in, in better ways. So, you know, and, and you know, AI is, is another element that we're seeing um, appliances include a lot more because what they are starting to do is actually self-improve their own performance and and learn you know what works last time what the preference was and then you know um, and kind of regulate and, and also like help troubleshoot and we're seeing a lot of a, a lot of that um, and then really interestingly is more and more partnerships so Two companies that that um, are not direct competitors, but they work within the same ecosystem. They're now combining forces to then share their audiences and try and create a new offering to go to market with. That you know, I guess uh, tries to address a lot of the the ones above. So, for example, uh, if you look at and um, you know a a food a food, um, a, a food uh, appliance uh, teaming up with a fresh fruit and veg or meal kit delivery service um, working together to then have or well, here's your ingredients and here's uh, you know the recipes to use in our appliance you know here's a here's a new offering to the market and they are trying to you know simplify people's daily lives with with solving uh, you know that that together um, it helps them do you know, multiple things within within that offering. You know, you've got your, your seven meals for the week or whatever, and it's also leading to health and well-being. So it's those those kind of things that are that are getting the market quite excited. Now into a couple of uh, case studies. And these are just I'm gonna have a lot of fun presenting these. So first up is Henlo and it is a coffee machine which is um, it's very very smart. Uh, the machine's smart but also the business idea is very smart. So the Henlo coffee machine was developed to help cafe owners 
consistently create the perfect cup of coffee. So, you know, when you order a cup of coffee and you want to go back into that, you really enjoyed it and you want to go back into the cafe to get the same one, but next time, next time you go in, it's slightly different or it's not what you're expecting. Well, what they've Hanlo have found is that customer attention is they want to come back and experience the same taste that they had before. And what this coffee machine does is helps cafe owners to like consistently create that perfect cup of coffee so that customers can reliably come back and experience you know, that taste that they enjoyed so that they retain more of those customers and then obviously increase um, uh, sales as a result of that. So Henlo chose 4D systems to, to embed a module, uh, a, a touchscreen uh, display um, in because the 4D system um, module was able to handle the temperature variations that you can imagine uh, it needs to, as well as handle uh, the wet environment that would be that it is exposed to in in coffee shops. So the industrial grade quality of this display, uh, particularly the glass bezel, um, and you know really from an aesthetics perspective, added to the pr premium design, and, and that's what Henlo were really going for. Now they were able to get to market. Uh, really quickly because while they had never used uh, 4D Systems development environment before, Workshop 4 Pro IDE, uh, they were able to lean on 4D's technical support team to help understand exactly what they needed to code into um, the display so that they could achieve the user experience needs that they were really wanting to, to achieve. Um, and it was really that that close working relationship uh, and and the and the advice that the technical support team could provide to Henlo that really made the, the this a really successful project. Um, another really successful project is Sinclair Hotel. So in Fort Worth, Texas, we have this beautiful, magnificent um, historic hotel, and obviously the the period uh, they wanted to keep the period appeal both internally and externally but while transforming it into uh, a more digital and sublime experience for hotel guests so in order to bridge that digital and human experience uh, Sinclair partnered with 4D Systems and we actually um, used a well customized a four discovery smart display uh, so that this interface would allow hotel guests to control their environment, so the light, the temperature, um, you know, uh, get in touch with, with hotel staff, but also, and really importantly, be able to interface with existing infrastructure throughout the building. So infrastructure that was set up from Intel, from Cisco, from Egotech, and that was really important because they wanted to achieve, you know, they needed to um, interface with the digital infrastructure behind the scenes um, and also allow that uh, the Sinclair to achieve immense energy savings uh, because they were able to then um, control the, the temperature and environment rather than, um, you know, more holistically through, through the building. So that's a really exciting uh, you know, and really quite a stunning example of how, you know, you can transform existing, you know, uh, you know hotels and, and use, a, use an interface to link in so many um, aspects. So the final case study is, is actually a, 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 an amazing one, to be honest. Um, Thea is based in, um, in Portugal and they had never developed a, a ventilator before, uh, but at the height of COVID, they needed to uh, and they really needed to respond to the immediate and overwhelming demand um, in Portugal and of citizens. So 
CS engineers had previously worked with a 4D uh, systems embedded display, and they actually had one in their production facilities uh, already. And so when the crisis hit, they used that. It was a Gen 4 micro LCD 70 DT intelligent display module with resistive touch, um, which you can see here. It's that's what was ultimately used as the antennas. Uh, this antenna is the ventilator, the antenna's primary user interface. Um, and and basically they were able to to use that display, prototype it, and then 4D Systems was able to ship um, them what they required to actually get this to market. But the requirements they had was that the graphic display needed to be intuitive. It needed to be really easy to program, feature rich, but most importantly, above everything else, it really needed to be reliable for the project and for the product. Um, it was just, it, it that was a it was an absolute non-negotiable. And this Gen 4 Micro LCD 70 DT fit all of those uh, conditions. Um, they programmed it using the uh, 40s, Workshop 4 Pro IDE and Visi Genie environments. And uh, and quite remarkably, within 45 days, they had a ventilator um, available, a medical invasive ventilator um, available that was saving lives after 45 days, um, which is just still blows me away. Um, so I hope these examples have kind of painted a little bit of a picture of really what you can achieve within a short period of time using a modular solution. And it's not actually um, as expensive as what it seems when you compare, you know, the price up front to a bill of materials, particularly when you look at um, all of the other resourcing costs that are available. Um, as I said, if you if you do need some support to choose the right one to to test, uh, please reach out to either our sales team, um, our distributors, or our support teams either via the website or or you can have a look at where our distributors are around the world, um, and be able to to support you on that journey. I do want to open it up to some Q and A. Uh, please feel free to use the Q and A um, module to ask any questions. We do have a couple, uh, so I will jump into those. Your modelling seems to assume the price for modules is fixed. Are volume discounts available? So, so thanks for that. Um, so yes, this 59.50 for the module is, um, yes, you're right, discounts are available. So if you are, you know, one is one price, 10, 50, 1,000, 6,000, you know, when you're getting up to those volumes, that, yeah, up, up, even, even 50, it, discount um, pricing kicks in. We've just uh, modelled it using a fixed price. We didn't want to add too many variables into it for this, this one, but absolutely volume pricing is available. Um, why is there such a huge cost difference between the developer costs? Oh. So here, this 140 versus 23,000. Um, so look, the, the primary reason is because of the the volume of low level development that's required to get your um, to, to get a built an in-house built uh, display up to the level that the modular design is already is already at um, so it we've we've based on our experience we're assuming that you'd need two development engineers full-time um, with with you know, experience um, for at least six months, and and that that cost is is obviously that cost differential is is 
is largely time, time and hours, really. Um, whereas if you've got a modular design, it's just a lot faster to not just plug in and play, but just to, to bring it up to that level. It takes a lot longer. Has anyone got any other questions? Thank you. Um, I can see a couple of questions have come through and I'm conscious that we're six minutes over. Um, they do look really uh, quite specific. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reach out to you individually um, and answer those questions, but I'll let everyone else go. Thank you so much for attending to, uh, today's webinar and uh, look forward to seeing you on future webinars and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for attending. Bye.